I was asked to put together this presentation here, which is mind mapping your business for rapid growth. Now, there's a lot of things that we could do as far as business growth goes. However, what we're going to focus on is some of the more high leverage areas when it comes to generating more business, more sales, more clients, and so forth. The areas are marketing, innovation, and consultative selling. So we're going to look at these three areas. And I was also asked if I could infuse in this video a conversation about public speaking. So I will do that as well. So let's go ahead and get started. Now, having many years of experience in entrepreneurship, actually full time since 2009, and having grown a successful IT business, being involved with a number of different businesses, and also built a successful YouTube channel, which as a result of the channel, I've created a number of training programs, I've done a lot of consulting, and other kinds of business activities that are related to what we're going to discuss here that really came as a foundation of these three areas. I recognize that it's important to focus on these areas primarily so that you can grow your business. Marketing, innovation, and consultative selling. I learned this from someone by the name of Peter Drucker. And he said that innovation and marketing are the two primary functions of a business. Everything else is an expense. Now, I like to look at this and segment it further and say consultative selling. It's a kind of selling. There's a book called Spin Selling by Neil Rackham, and I recommend it. And it gets into the distinction between transactional selling and consultative selling. I believe that consultative selling is something that we can learn, which we'll get into, that will allow us to generate more sales, convert more prospects into clients, as well as allow us to put together business deals, form partnerships, and so forth. Because the reality is that in business, we are always selling. We're selling a product or service. We're selling an idea. We're selling our team and our vendors and our clients the opportunity to do business with us in some shape or form. So it's something that we want to practice. Marketing can be looked at as attracting the ideal prospects or client, putting out a message such as YouTube videos or running ads to generate exposure and generate leads that we can convert over to clients. What happens after you generate the lead is you go into selling, sales, consultative selling. Now, in order to be able to sell something, we must have a product or service. So we need to innovate. We need to find a product or service, or we need to create a product or service or a combination of products or services so that we can make an offer to the ideal prospects that we generate via marketing and engage in conversations, which we call selling. So to grow your business rapidly, you want to focus more on these three areas. Let's go ahead and get started here. So what you can do with this mind map that I've put together is you can actually build upon it. Take your notes and add more subtopics here so that you can reflect upon this mind map. And I'm going to give this as an overview and you can reflect upon it on your business and plug in the attributes or elements or insights in relation to your business. So you can clarify this and make this specific to your business growth. Now, ideally, we always want to start with something known as a client avatar. This represents what we would sometimes refer to as demographics, but I would like to take this a little further and say it represents a profile or a persona of the kind of individuals you are looking to attract as far as clients go into your business. So we want to get to know who our audience is. We want to get to know who our ideal clients are. And we do this through the process of creating a client avatar. Now, it's advisable to sit down at the start of your business and map this out, but always understand something. 
as we're continuing the business growth, as we're continuing the research, as we're continuing the implementation of our product or service in the market, we also understand and learn who our clients are. And we understand to a higher degree of vivid accuracy who it is that we're looking to reach. So consider this client avatar more of a work in progress. There can be a certain stage in your journey when you have a certain level of clarity where you feel very comfortable as to where you are going to market your product or service. This client avatar concept is very important because let's say you're running online ads. It's important to target the ads to the ideal audience. Otherwise, you would not resonate with those that are not interested in what you have to offer. This could save you a lot of investment money when it comes to running ads. The same is to be said about, let's say, if you were running an event. You probably wouldn't want everybody showing up to the event, although that would be nice because we would think, theoretically, that then more people see our product or service, the more people will buy. The way it actually works is we want to actually put together an event that targets, we want to bring it to the awareness of those that are qualified to do business with us. Let's say it's an event that you're hosting so that you can bring awareness to your product or service. This applies not just for a offline event, like a live in-person event, but also applies to webinars or Zoom calls that you have set up or any kind of online platform-based application where you are going to engage with your audience. You're looking for the right people to show up that relates over to what you have to offer. So the way we do this is to ask ourselves these questions here. We want to know what are the challenges and emotional pain points that our prospects have in relation to the product or service that you're offering. For example, when I was growing my IT business, I recognized that the challenges that they were having were things like they were unable to find a reputable IT service company that was reliable, that they could reach at a reasonable time if they had an issue. They didn't want to put out a ticket or, as we say that in the IT world, or a call to the help desk and have to wait many hours so that their business would be impacted before they got the service. That was one of the challenges that they had dealing with other vendors. Where do they congregate? So we can look at where do they hang out, online or offline? Is it certain websites like Facebook? Or is it certain kinds of live events? If I reflect back on my experience, I remember part of what I used to do was I used to do internet marketing, internet business packages for those that are just getting started out in the space who are starting out with a business and don't know where to turn as far as resources and education in relation to online business. So I would go to events where these individuals would be. These were events where they were network kind of events for their particular industry. But I knew that in those events, there were going to be people that were looking for these kinds of services. So by showing up to these events, I would be able to connect with individuals who were interested in that particular service that I was offering. Who are their leaders? This is very important because... Generally, your clients and prospects tend to look up to people, tend to admire certain people, tend to respect certain people, and they tend to participate in different events or online congregations in relation to their leaders. It's a very important reflection because then what we could do is we can study and understand more about our clients so we can understand how they think how they believe reality to work, what are their opinions on various things so that we can really hone in and infuse this in our communication when it comes to selling, as well as this information here helps us innovate, creates products or services, or refine our products and services. Also, what websites do they visit? 
What kind of information do they consume and how? A lot of what many businesses do nowadays is online marketing, looking to reach their ideal clients via the online space of Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, many other platforms. And we want to know what sites your ideal client visits. Maybe one of your findings is that they actually go to Instagram more so and rarely do ever go to TikTok, let's say. So then it would be best to have this information so that when you know you are ready to roll out a marketing campaign or a product or service, you'd be better equipped to generate the traffic or the visitors over from the platform that would be ideal, in this case, Instagram. And how do they consume this information is also an important question because some individuals prefer communicating auditory-based information. Some like watching videos. Some like reading blog posts. If you can understand the kind of information that they consume and where they consume that information and how they consume that information, this will bring us an enormous amount of understanding as to who our clients are. We also want to know their pains, their desires, their frustrations, and we want to tie this into our product or service, both in our communication and the consultative selling part, as well as also our product or service innovation, customizing our product or service to fit. You also want to know what do they do with their leisure time? Now, this is very important because if you understand what they do in their leisure time, if you understand what they do in their personal life, and maybe you're dealing with a business to consumer or you could be dealing with business to business, regardless, I believe it's important to know this because if you do, then you can learn how to speak their language. You can learn how to communicate in a way that they feel relatable, their phraseology, their terminology and how they go about communicating because when we're writing our marketing messages or when we're selling, we want to be relatable with our prospects and our clients. Here are some good questions to further reflect upon. So these are some generalities here in creating a client avatar. Here are some questions that we want to ask ourselves regularly so that we can further build a relationship with our clients uncover new markets even, uncover deeper understandings of our existing prospects, clients, and market, and so forth. Why should your prospect act now? So one of the things that we always aim to do when it comes to business growth is we want to facilitate a faster sale. And we want to understand what really is the psychology behind influential decisions someone facilitating a decision as a result of a conversation you're having with them could be things like they need to act now because for example i'll use my it business if they don't they risk having their systems compromise with malware or viruses if they don't address some of the issues that they're having with their computers right now and their network their security issues they put themselves at that risk. So this would be something that would be beneficial for me to know because then I could ask them during the consultative selling process if they're aware of this risk by not joining the service right away. Why might your prospects say no? Now, this is something that we usually generally tend to find in the consultative selling process. And why I'm including this in the marketing section here is because if you're putting together a presentation or videos or blog post or any kind of communication, one of our goals is to be able to understand what they will potentially say no to so that we could somehow communicate and help them overcome that objection in the marketing. Now, I'm not going to get into the techniques and strategies. This video discussion is really about focusing on the key areas and giving you a certain level of insight, because certainly based on my experience and working with many businesses, we can get very deep into these topics here, but this is enough so that it can get you started. Next is, 
What are all the benefits your product and service offers? Now I'm talking about benefits. I'm not speaking a feature. So feature would be something like, let's say you're selling an IT package. One of the features is it comes with 24 hour support. You want to know the benefit for the 24 hour support because a lot of times the client might not see the benefit from it as obvious as it may seem to ourselves. So we want to communicate it. So I may say something like the benefit is that they get access to me if something happens in their network within a two to three hour time block. That way they don't end up having to deal with the outage or the downtime, which affects their business. Now, this is important to know because even though I'm offering the feature of 24 hour support, I also clarify it further by articulating to myself and even if needed in the presentation to them, the benefit that they will receive as a result of that feature. Why should the prospect believe you? So this is where we might have to look at case studies, testimonials, experiences that we've had. We want to take note of these areas so that if we need to bring it up in our marketing, now, you'll see this in different marketing. You might see something like someone bringing up testimonials of other clients raving about the kind of service, the kind of results that they get as a result of working with you. The way we get those testimonials or that kind of credibility is to reflect upon this question. Why would they believe you? Usually, generally, we tend to believe others that we like and trust. And trust is established through credibility, proof. How is your product different from the other available options? Now, certainly, whatever product or service that you have, unless it's something that is very unique and very distinct, it generally tends to fall within certain categories. For example, a person may have an app, a productivity app, that helps an individual with time management by demonstrating some best practices and keeping them accountable and so forth. There's also different kinds of offline ways of doing that, such as doing it with a organizing planner, for example, or there might be other apps available in that particular market. You could say productivity based apps. When we put out something like this, and we recognize that people look and they browse through the app store, they're going to look at the various different options of the things available before they decide that they're going to work with an app. And perhaps they might be comparing different apps. And so if we know how our product or service, the different functionality of our product or service in relation to the other apps that are out there, and we know the benefits that it offers to the client, then what we could do is combine that in our app description, for example, or the website for the app, so that when somebody looks at it, they say, oh, this app is for me. This is what I'm looking for. And it's different from these other products. And you can even do things like comparisons, the difference between using this product and this other product. What's the difference? What are the benefits you're going to get from using your product versus the other products? That's why it's important to note these things down because we can oftentimes forget about these things and be included in the mind map because then we realize that if we need to reference this, then we have it stored here in the mind map and we can come back to this mind map and refer to it when we are creating our marketing or communication or anything related to getting our message out there. Who are you selling this product to? may seem like a very simple question, but we recognize that by working with client avatar here, it's important to know certain distinctions about who we are directing this product or service to, because that can help us with our marketing, our branding, packaging, and so forth, so that it feels very relatable and it resonates very deeply to the best of our ability. We don't have to be perfect at these things. We certainly get better at it with practice. As I look back at my experience, I've gotten better at doing this over the years. But I reflect upon these things 
regularly so that I could further refine. And essentially, who are you selling this product to is answered via going deeper, drilling down into the client avatar and building upon it regularly. Now, I generally have this marketing checklist. So if you're putting together ads, if you're putting together blog posts, if you're putting together videos, if you're putting together any kind of marketing content, you might want to reflect on some of these marketing checklist points here and consider integrating all of these or whatever is required depending on what it is that you're working on. You might not use all of them, but these are generally the kind of calibrators that I work with to put together good marketing. So the marketing contains what they are looking for. There's some kind of message, and this message is offering them some value. It's emotionally and mentally relatable to them, such as the communication style, the words that I use, the specificity in relation to the benefits that they're getting, which is beyond the features. The benefits are usually a result of the features, but we want to make sure we're communicating that. It's establishing a like and trust because people love to do business with those that they like and trust. So the credibility thing, the likability, the conversation is flowing with comprehension, as in whatever kind of video or marketing piece you put out, people are understanding, whoever's watching it is understanding how it's relatable to them. They're establishing that like and trust with you, and they're understanding what is being communicated. Essentially value. You're offering some kind of value. A lot of times we see on the space of YouTube, for example, I built a very successful YouTube channel at the time me making this video, it's at about 322,000 subscribers. One of the reasons why the channel has grown so much is because I offer value. I look for pains, frustrations, desires that people have, and I communicate my experiences and I communicate solutions and I communicate ideas in the content. So they feel that they're getting value from it. They subscribe to my channel. And somewhere down the road, they end up doing business with me or referring me to others that end up doing business with me. Feel, felt, found. Now, this is an interesting thing that I learned on my journey of improving my consultative selling. It's essentially identifying with your market in a way that they feel resonant to you. Now, there's a lot of ways of doing this. You could tell stories, for example. But they feel that you understand them at a deep level. And you've kind of, in a way, felt what they have felt or you've helped clients who have felt the pains that they have felt. And you have found the solution. We also want to give clear next steps, otherwise known as call to action. And if needed, if we're putting out an offer on the marketing directly to reach out to us to book a call or to buy, then we want to translate the value we're offering into a currency. For example, a person might say, we offer this service, we provide a guarantee, we also provide ongoing support, we also provide some bonuses and so forth, and all of this is worth $5,000. And what we're going to do is offer you a deal if you were to join our service within the next week for $3,000, something like that. We also want to reduce or eliminate risk. So sometimes a money-back guarantee, which is generally standard, we present that. We say, you know, if you're not happy with this service over the next 10 days, we can cancel the term or something like that. So not all of these need to be used, but these are good things to keep into consideration to elevate your marketing. Now, generally, when we market, we have a product or service already that they want, the market wants, or we have done our research and we believe the market wants. I also believe that innovation, which is creating products or services, is also discovered while you're marketing. Because if you're asking yourselves, those thought-provoking questions, such as the ones that I suggested, you'll find that you might uncover new markets, new products or services, and so forth. So here are some ideas to help you when it comes to innovation, product or service. First of all, this is one of my favorites here. Being in business for a long time, I find this is very important. Doing what you love to do. If 
I'm going to create a product or service, then I want to love my product or service and I want to love working and fulfilling if fulfillment is required. Let's say it's a service. Doing something that I really love to do. I really enjoyed building my IT business. I really enjoy certain aspects of consulting or certain kind of consulting. I really enjoy teaching. I really enjoy creating programs. So as I had found different needs in the marketplace, I was asking myself the question, how could I serve? How could I meet up with a product or service to serve that audience or that marketplace while doing what I love to do? which then I came up with the ideas on how to do it. Are you naturally good at it? And by the way, these are just questions to stimulate helping you find and refine your niche market, which is essentially a segment of the market, something you're going to target, which also combines very nicely with the client avatar and the other things we talked about in the previous section. Is this a niche that you feel comfortable marketing in? Is it evergreen as in, this is not necessarily a criteria, but one that I use for myself, but it's not something that I would say has to be there. Evergreen just means it's going to be around for a long time. Because personally, I like to create businesses that can have the potentiality to be around 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Now, that's my own personal preference, but maybe there are some opportunities that might not last after a couple of years, depending on how the market turns and so forth. Are there people already in the niche? Can you offer something unique, different, or better? Do the people within the niche have a urgent problem that they need a solution for or passion they spend money on? Is this a scalable business that could potentially be automated? Now, these are some of the questions that I ask, probably because I come more from an IT background of automation, is I like to build scalable business that can be automated in part or in whole. So if I'm going to get involved with a product or service, or if I'm going to get involved with a niche, or if I'm going to innovate, I'm going to keep that into consideration. And from these questions and also our reflections on marketing, client avatar, marketing checklist, questions to ask ourselves, we can then ask ourselves, what kind of digital products can we create? Physical products? or service-based, or combination. For example, a person might have a digital product, a course, or a program. They might complement that with a physical product, like a journal or a planner. And they might even offer a service to consult or coach or mentor. It can be done in combination at different price points, helping fulfill what the client is looking for, which is a complete package, something that they can work with online via the training, something that they can physically work with. They can have a physical planner on their desk, like a day planner or a journal, and they can be receiving a service from you, mentorship or coaching on how to use the journal in relation to the physical product, the course, or the training. So these are some ideas on innovation. So let's talk about consultative selling. Now, again, I recommend reading a book called Spin Selling by Neil Rackham because in that book, he gets into very deep detail as to how to go about this process. I would just like to stimulate this conversation with you. Maybe you already know what this is and encourage you to get more into this concept because it'll help you with your marketing innovation. Now, by the way, Focusing on marketing and getting very precise in your marketing and targeting your marketing, coming up with good product or service and innovation and putting your attention and energy on it will allow you to grow your business faster because those are the areas that are going to generate more prospects, more leads, more clients. Thus, prioritizing it is very important. Now, once you generate the prospects or the leads, you want to look at consultative selling. So the difference is, this is not transactional selling. This is problem solving. You're essentially jumping on a phone call. You're engaging in an email dialogue. And it's more of helping them connect their pains, desires, frustrations, and what you've uncovered in the 
exercise with the client avatar and the previous information over to the benefits that they will receive. And you do this via conversation or you do this via email or any kind of dialogue, live presentation, webinar, one-on-one, -on -one, Zoom call, different ways of connecting their pains, their needs, their desires, their frustrations over to the benefits that they will receive as a result of working with your product, using your product or service. This is also a lifetime client approach because what we're looking to do is build a relationship. See, what we have found is that clients end up coming back and buying more products or services once they establish that like and trust with you. And you're more likely to make a referral. You're more likely then to do another deal with them because they've already had such a favorable experience with you, provided that you fulfilled on the product or service in a way that they enjoyed the experience. And we want to aim for lifetime clients. It's not always the case that someone will be a client for life, but we like to do ongoing business because a lot of times it can cost a lot when it comes to marketing to acquire the client. And so we want to realize more profits and grow our business faster by engaging deeper in the relationships with our prospects and clients and see them more from a lifetime client approach. So we want to get to know and build a relationship with the prospect. This is all done through the consultative selling process. And by the way, I did put together a entrepreneurial program where we get deeper into this stuff. I'll include a link either at the bottom of this post or somewhere on this page or at the video, bottom of the video, in which if you would like to become a student of my program, then we get into these things in a very deep detail. It's a six to eight hour program. So we're interested in creating custom solutions versus trying to sell or force a product or service. And, you know, if you want to know more about how this is done, again, my program, as well as Spin Selling by Neil Rackham, which is a book that I recommend. It would be a very long video if I went into all the details here, but this is here to stimulate some ideas. And perhaps you're already doing these things. What we find is many business do some of these things, although we want to do more of these things more often and to a deeper degree, and we want to remind ourselves that these are the things that are actually driving the business growth. So we're learning about our prospects, wants, needs, pains, frustrations, and desires, which then can be translated over to better marketing, better innovation. One of the important factors that we want to keep in consideration here is that through the consultative selling, we get more ideas and insights from application, from practice, that we could infuse in our innovation and our marketing. So we're communicating only with prospects that really do need and want what we have. As mentioned, with our marketing, we aim to target over to our client avatar, those that fit that profile. And in consultative selling, we want to refine it further or connect the dots or bridge any kind of disconnects between them receiving the benefits through our product or service, as well as any concerns or maybe certain things that they want to discuss before they're ready to move forward. This is done through the selling process. A lot of times what we'll find is the prospects generally tend to do more of the talking. As a consultative sales rep, we do a lot of listening because we're aiming to understand. We're aiming to get a lot of data, insights. And so we ask certain questions. And these questions are designed to stimulate certain kinds of responses. A lot of them tie into the marketing checklist that I gave over here, which I'm going to echo again. We're trying to see what they're looking for. We're figuring out how to be more emotional and mentally relatable to them. We're building that like and trust. We're understanding what facilitates good comprehension for them. We want to make sure that that value that we're providing is something that they actually see as value and all these other things that we talked about earlier. So the consultative selling process happens when your leads reach out to you. So we want to refine our ability to sell. And so what we want to do with this mind map is plug in, take any notes in relation to these attributes here, and actually go and integrate this back into our business. As we have discovered, and I've discovered this also all throughout my journey, 
Those that focus more on the selling, marketing, and innovation generally tend to grow their business a lot faster because then they'll bring in more income, more sources of revenue, greater volume of revenue, and then they could reinvest that back into operations, fulfillment, automation, hiring people, delegating, automating, or bringing in people to help optimize their business and maybe even eliminate some of the unnecessary and excess things, the expenses. So this is really what we want to focus on. So I trust that you found this to be very helpful. Maybe you're already doing these things, so it's a good reminder to focus on these three areas. One of the things that I was also asked to do is relate back to this presentation over to influential speaking. So I put together these presentations because for all these reasons here, I would like to share and provide value and contribute to your business growth. And perhaps if it's a right fit, then you might be interested in one of the products or services that I have to offer. So this whole video is designed to integrate all these things here. And you can really see that it's designed more to you, what you're looking for and so forth. So this is influential public speaking. So I was asked to give an overview as to how I would structure a presentation when I'm speaking publicly. So generally, I tend to work off mind maps because they are an excellent way of organizing a presentation. I personally enjoy even recording videos off the mind map, but someone can just create a mind map of their presentation, such as like how I did right here, and get to a level of proficiency where they can then, you know, maybe have a few bullet points on their screen. Although, as I said, I love working with mind maps and present in this way that I just did with you. Very fluid, very dynamic, and it's structured in a way that's clear, precise, and it flows nicely. So essentially, this is the format that I work with here. There's six parts to it. There's the opening, in which you discuss the purpose of the presentation to get the attention. There's the introduction, telling, explaining, and just sharing a little bit as to why they are here and why ideally they should listen to you and what's in it for them. Then we get into the first point. For me, it was the marketing. Then we get into the second point, and I like to tie everything together. So this is the key. I personally don't like to go from one point to the next. I like to tie it all together. I like to show the relationships between, for example here, how I related the marketing over to innovation, over to consultative selling, and how they're all related, and how they're actually all fused together. This helps keep the audience engaged, and they feel connected, and through the relatability, they're forming connections in their mind, and they're becoming even more engaged, and also it's stimulating ideas. Same is to be said about the third point, and they all naturally flow together. And then I summarize at the end, bring a conclusion or a call to action, such as the ones that I offered, and that's how I put together a presentation. So you could use this format as well. This is included in the mind map. And you can go through this video a number of times and even use this as a model for putting together a presentation because these are typically the kind of presentations that I do when I make my videos or I do sales presentations. Any kind of influential speaking that is designed to help people go through a behavioral change, a transformational change, or to offer something that I believe is of value and so this can be very helpful for you. Now also peppered in here, I absolutely love working with this marketing checklist that I've discovered over the years and I've put together and refined over the years that infused in the presentation, you know, which is the opening, introduction, first point, second point, third point, and summary are these elements, that it is what they're looking for, it's emotional and mentally relatable, it's establishing like and trust, there's a higher degree of comprehension as a person is sitting through the presentation. There's value being offered. And there's even some examples. And I've got many business examples, so I wanted to keep this video very concise. But it's designed, those examples or stories are designed to create the relatability, the feel felt found. There's even some clear next steps. And we're not translating value into currency in this presentation because, as mentioned, you don't have to use all of these marketing points. You just want to use the ones that are relevant based on your objective.
And if you were offering something, then, you know, the reducing or eliminating risk thing can be kept into consideration as well. All right, so thank you very much for watching this video. I trust that you found this to be helpful, insightful, beneficial, and also help you refine further how you go about operating your business and where you focus your time, energy, resources, and opportunity cost. The reason why is because, as mentioned, through all my work, and I've been involved with many businesses, my own and many businesses through consulting and partnerships and so forth, and I absolutely love business building and entrepreneurship. What we have found all throughout the journey is exactly what Peter Drucker mentioned. Marketing and innovation, two primary functions of the business. And then I also like to add consultative selling into it. These are going to be the three areas that we want to focus on to rapidly grow our business. Thank you very much for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.